Good morning on this beautiful Sunday. Let us now worship God. People of God, run to our welcoming God. Holy One, you never pass us by. People of God, proclaim our, proclaim our love for the God of love. You hear our voices, you hear our cries, and receive our praise. People of God, sing God's good news to the world. Empowering one, you give us power to be signs of the kingdom of heaven. Our opening prayer. God of wondrous love, your miracles always catch us by surprise. Steadfast source of mercy and grace, we long for you to touch our lives as you touch the lives of Sarah and Abraham. We yearn to laugh at blessings that are so unlikely. We can scarcely believe them. We desire to feel in our very bones that no problem we face is beyond your care. Grant us the wisdom to put our trust in you and to offer you our songs of praise and our shouts of joy. Amen.
call to reconciliation. Relationships broken, hopes cast off, promises fade like mist. The deep chasm of sin in our lives separates us and causes division. Even into this human mess, God calls to us, beckoning that we turn, that we lift our eyes and see hope on the horizon. Let us join together in prayer, saying, ever present, ever listening, and ever empowering God. We often fall short when responding to your love. You promise us blessings, yet we often laugh in cynicism and disbelief. You always love us, yet we often act distant and even hostile. You empower us to be your loving presence, yet we often seek this power for ourselves. We call upon you now, knowing that you hear our voices and our supplications. We call upon you in this place, knowing that no accomplishment is too wonderful for you to accomplish. For there is no limit to your love for all people, and there is no end to your mercy. In Jesus' names we pray. Amen. My friends, in life and death and the resurrection of Jesus, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. No hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts us. Be assured that God is with you even now, accepting, guiding and forgiving. As people of hope and disciples of holy love, let us share signs of joy and peace with one another today. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Holy God, Word made flesh, let us come to this Word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, penetrate the corners of our hearts with this Word. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Our first reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 13. 
By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob, who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. So descendants were born from one man, and he was as good as dead. They were as many as the number of the stars in the sky and as countless as the grains of sand on the seashore. All these people died in faith without receiving the promises, but they saw the promises from a distance and welcomed them. They confessed they were strangers and immigrants on earth. Um, we're going to be singing two songs today, one you'll probably recognize and one that might be a little new that Tegan actually taught me from her schooling. So here we go. Light a candle for peace, light a candle for love, light a candle that shines all the way around the world. Light a candle for me, light a candle for you, that our wish for world peace will one day come true. Light a candle for peace, light a candle for love, light a candle that shines all the way around the world. Light a candle for me, light a candle for you, that I wish for world peace will one day come true. Sing peace around the world, sing peace around the world, sing peace around the world, sing peace around the world. Light a candle for peace, light a candle for love, light a candle that shines. Light a candle for me, light a candle for you, that a wish for world peace will one day come true. Right. Hey, you got the peace like a river? Okay. Right. Yes, yeah. This is the one you might know and feel free to sing along. I've got uh, peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, 
We are going to go straight into our story today with our reading. So there's a lot of scripture right here, and I'm not reading all of them. I will tell you what I'm reading, but that is the story of Sarah and Hagar and the places you can find them in the Bible. Um, the scripture we are going to focus on today is 1st Genesis 16, sort of verses 1 through 15, give or take, and I'll just read through them. Um, and then as we go on, I'll keep on telling you where we are at. So let us hear the word of God for us today. Genesis 16, verses 1 through 15. Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to have children. Since she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar, Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from giving birth, so go to my servant. Maybe she will provide me with children. And Abram did as Sarai said. After Abram had lived ten years on the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took her Egyptian servant Hagar and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He slept with Hagar and she became pregnant, but when she realized that she was pregnant, she no longer respected her mistress. So Sarai said to Abram, this harassment is your fault. I allowed you to embrace my servant, but when she realized she was pregnant, I lost her respect. Let the Lord decide who's right, me or you. And Abram said to Sarai, since she's your servant, do whatever you wish to her. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she ran away from Sarai. And the Lord's messenger found Hagar at a spring in the desert, the spring on the road to Shur, and said to Hagar, Sarai's servant, where did you come from and where are you going? She said from Sarai, my mistress, I'm running away. And the Lord's messenger said to her, go back to your mistress, put up with her harsh treatment of you. The Lord's messenger also said to her, I will give you many children, so many they can't be counted. The Lord's messenger said to her, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son and you will name him Ishmael because the Lord has heard about your harsh treatment. And Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy, because she said, can I still see after he saw me? Hagar gave birth to a son for Abram, and Abram named him Ishmael. I'm also gonna read a short little part from Genesis 18, verses 9 through 15, they said to him, where's your wife Sarah? And she said, right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year, and then your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abra Abram and Sarah were bo both old, and Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband's old. And the Lord said to Abram, why did Sarah laugh and say, me, give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. 
And then just a little bit from Genesis 21. The Lord was attentive to Sarah, just as he said, and the Lord carried out just what he had promised her. So she became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abram when he was old, at the very time God had told him. And Abram named his son the one Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abram circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abram. And she said to Abram, send the servant away with her son. This servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. God said to Abram, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant's son a great nation too, because he is also your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning and took some bread and flask of water and gave it to Hagar. And he put the boy in a shoulder sling and sent her away. And finally the water in the flask ran out and she put the boy down under a bush under a desert shrub, I'm sorry, and walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. So she sat at a distance, cried out in grief and wept. God heard the boy's cries and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up. Pick up the boy and take him by the hand because I will make him a great nation. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well and she went over and filled the flask and gave the boy a drink. And God remained with the boy and he grew up, grew up and lived in the desert and became an expert archer. This is the word of the Lord. So this is our second in our series of women's stories in the Bible. And this story that we read today, and I don't know if you can read the whole story, like so many of the stories of the woman in the Bible is a hard story to read. The story of two women both so different in so many ways, and yet in others, so similar. It's a, it's a messy story full of heartbreak and tragedy, oppression and slavery, abused woman. It is a story that makes my skin crawl a little you know, one of those that you'd rather skirt around or touch really lightly because they might just raise an issue that you are not sure what to do with. One of those stories that speak to things that makes us incredibly uncomfortable. This story of Saray, Saray and, and Hagar one, an older woman, a barren woman with power who would become the matriarch of God's chosen nation. The other one, young, fertile, oppressed and enslaved without any power, who would also become the mother of a nation. See, despite all the messiness we find in this story, there are also promises and blessings from a God who does care, a God who sees and who hears the cries of the oppressed and the marginalized, just as God blesses God's chosen. 
And most of us do know some or most of this story, but I am going to go back and just fill in a little bit. Because see, this whole thing starts way back with a promise to Abram that he would have land and as many children as the stars in the sky will be his descendants. And this will happen so that he can be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. So Abram packs up, as God says, and he takes his wife, Sarai, and moves them to Ur. And when famine strikes there, he decides to move to Egypt. But this is where it gets really ugly. Because when they get to Egypt, Abram is a little afraid of his life because apparently Sarah was really pretty. And he fears that he might be killed so someone might take his wife. So he walks up to Pharaoh and says, ha, it's my sister, really, have her. And she gets taken into the harem of Pharaoh. taken and abused sexually. And Abram? Abram gets handsomely rewarded for his wife with livestock and male and female slaves, and he walks away a rich man. And she had no say. But see, Pharaoh, Pharaoh finds out because there's a plague that comes over his household, and he realizes he has been deceived. So he calls Abram up, and he says, this is your wife, take her and get away from me. And for Sarai, for your troubles and your inconvenience that you experienced in my harem, have this slave, her name is Hagar. And yet... The story doesn't end, and there is no satisfaction, because see, there was this promise, and Sarai is still barren. And they just cannot wait for God, can they? So they take matters into their own hands, and Sarai gave, gave Hagar to Abram. Gave her as something that you could just take or give or handle like an object. And there's this cycle here. The one that has been abused in a harem in Egypt now becomes the oppressor who plays the same game with an unknown slave girl. Someone to be given and taken at will. Because see, Hagar was really not important now, was she? She was just a black Egyptian girl. Hagar was probably not even her real name. Because the Hebrew Hagar really just means foreigner. Or the other. She was not even afforded the dignity of having her real name remembered and written down in Scripture. She was just a slave girl. No status. And Sarai? Well, she, she couldn't conceive, which was the only thing that woman was really good for back in that patriarchal society. So can you imagine the whispering that has been going on behind her back about her inability to produce a hair? So many broken people, taken people, abused people. And Hagar does get pregnant with Abram's child. And that's when animosity and jealousy and hatred steps into Sarah's life because she now realizes that the lowest of the low has something that she does not have. And she complains to Abram, but he doesn't want to get in the fray and wipes his hands and says, it's your problem. You deal with it. So she treats Hagar 
if she could, any worse. And the words in Hebrew used here are the same that are used for physical and sexual abuse in the Old Testament. And it finally got to the point that Hagar could not stand it anymore, and she runs, putting her own life and the life of her unborn child at risk. She runs. Runs into the desert, running for her life, and that is where an angel appears to Hagar. This nothing Egyptian slave girl, this nobody not part of god's chosen and yet and yet here this hagar becomes the first woman in the bible who gets to meet god and yet and yet she becomes the first woman in the Bible who receives a promise from God himself, descendants, as many that they cannot be counted. And she becomes the only person in the Bible that ever named God. Alroy, she says, Alroy, because you are the living God who saw me. God who sees the suffering of a used and an abused woman, who tells her to name her child Ishmael. Ishmael, which means God hears. So with more faith that in this God than Abram and Sarai could muster, Hagar returns to the place of her abuse until about 15 years later, finally Sarai gave birth to Isaac. And if you thought there was abuse, you should see it now. The laughter which is the meaning of Isaac's name, doesn't laugh, last long. Sarah now has her own child. She has no use for Hagar anymore. In fact, Hagar becomes a threat together with Ishmael because, see, really, he was the firstborn. And he might just step in and get the inheritance that she so badly wants for Isaac, her son. So she goes to Abram and says, get rid of her. Don't want her around no more. What does Abram do? He gets a flask of water and a piece of bread, and he sends them into the desert. I wonder if he thought that by this action, maybe he can wash his hands and say, at least I did a little something, something. But see, in the desert, a flask of water and a little piece of bread does not last a whole long time. And when nothing is left and there is nothing more to be had, she takes her son. I want you to hear this and puts him under a bush and walks away because she cannot bear to hear his cries. She cannot bear to see her own child die. She cannot bear any more that no one cares. And I wonder that maybe she has forgotten God's promise because everyone else forgot her, didn't they? Can you bear that? Can you bear the pathos and the grief and the desperation as Hagar weeps for her child? God still sees. God still hears. And God still meets Hagar again in the desert. Hagar, what is wrong 
God asked. The God who sees and hears is also the God who sits down and listens. Who truly listen and hear and he tells her to not be afraid. And he shows her water. This first woman in the Bible to see God saw God more than once. He was told not to be afraid. And was taken care of by Elroy, the living God who sees me. And Ishmael did grow up. And Muslims today believe that Ishmael is the father of Islam. This is a hard story. This is a messy and a very human story filled with pain and anguish all around of being forgotten and of being taken and of being given like objects. And it feels to me like where in the world does anyone in this story step up for anything that is right and that is good? I mean, really? Where do you find the saints in this story? Maybe but for Hagar. And we do avert our eyes, don't we? And we sort of listen halfway. Because we might just find ourselves in this story. A familiar story for those who are abused or taken or given and who still bears the scars and the wounds and wonders if anyone ever sees or hears or really, really cares. Elroy sees you. Elroy hears you, my friends. Elroy shows new wells of water to drink from that brings healing and wholeness and shalom. But it is also a story uncomfortably so familiar to many of us as we have a hard time looking or listening to the stories of those that society deems less than those whom society oppress and see as worthless as nothing afraid to spend time with them uncomfortable most possibly because it might just cost us something or having to move into a desert to find those who have been thrown away and tossed aside by society hellbent on saving their own skin and working towards their own promises and prosperity. There are so many cries in the world today, my friends. It's Juneteenth today. Can we still hear the cries of those who were massacred in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Can we still hear those cries today of people with brown and black skins that cannot get a break in our society, that are red-lined and not well-educated and not getting good health care? still oppressed and imprisoned and working for low wages? Can we hear the cries today of innocence and grocery stores and schools and cinemas and malls being mowed down by guns that are meant for war? Can we hear the cries of migrants sitting at borders, not just here, in Europe too, crying for safety and the place to live? Can we hear the cries of our LGBTQ siblings who are still being afforded second place in so many places in this world, who are abused because they're trans and not normal? 
Can we hear the cries of those who are homeless, of kids going to bed with empty bellies? Can we hear the cries of the imprisoned, of the sexually trafficked, who wants to be seen and set free, and the abused who cries for healing? And if we do, how do we respond, my friends? Do we do as Sarah and Abram did? Use them for whatever they worth or for what we need service for and then discard them? Do we give them a handout and walk away and say that we have done our part? assuming that there is only so much of God's promise to go around. In South Africa, the Zulu word to greet someone is saubona. It means, I see you. Not, hey, how are you? But, hello, I see you as a human being for who and what you are. And the response to Saubona is Nikona, which means I am here, I am truly human because you see me. If this story tells us anything, my friend, is it is that our God is the God who sees. Sabona. Elroy, a God who notices us for whoever we are, however we are, and whatever we are. A God who loves us no matter what, despite our messes and the pain that we carry. Whatever we have suffered and survived. God sees and hears and then carries us back to life. And us, us who seek to follow Christ, we must seek to see God in one another. That's what Jesus did again and again and again. He saw the blind man. He saw the prostitutes. He saw the crippled men. He saw the woman who was poor and yet offered everything she had. Jesus saw them and loved them and responded by offering love and offering healing. Jesus responded by sacrificially laying his own life down for us so that we may live. And so we are called to, my friends. We are called to see and to offer that same love. To step out in this messy world of abused and broken and suffering people and to see. To see God in all of them. And to love them the same way that God loves with reckless abandon and compassion and mercy. Can we do that, my friends. Can we say, Saubona? May it be so.
see the Let us now turn to the God who sees and who hears and restore us to life as we hold our lives before that God. God of love, you spoke worlds into being. You breathe, your breath gives us life. And we give you thanks for your story from before time began to long past our imagination. All that time you have spinning the greatest story ever told. Help us to see in that your creative hand at work and join our story to yours. Because you are our forgiveness, gracious God, not because you should, but because it is what you desire to offer us that compassion which welcomes all who have been tossed aside. And you are our justice, brother of the forgotten, welcoming all those weakened by oppression, hungering for hope, who have been judged but never heard. And you are our healing spirit of comfort bringing peace where we would do violence and offering hope to all who we choose to despise and remembering everyone that we have forgotten. Knowing that you are the God who sees and hears and cares for us, we come to you with all our needs. As we pray for this world, that its riches and resources be used responsibly and fairly. That rulers and leaders may govern with justice and compassion and humility. That humankind may live with understanding and respect, noticing what unites us. We pray in humility for all our siblings around the world who are dehumanized by their struggle for existence. May we listen. For those who are overshadowed by the constancy, constancy of death that we may notice. For those who are abused and given and taken that we may show up. And for those who are ensnared by systems beyond their control, may we demand change. Inundate the world with humanity. Overwhelm the world with truth. Flooded with kindness. Upset our indifference and compel us to authentic discipleship that nurtures creation and embodies love and breathes life. And on this day in particular, God, we praise you for the liberating power that broke shackles of oppression and restored humanity to the disenfranchised, but not completely. So we pray that you make us instrument of grace to resist slavery and all its manifestations so that no soul shall be denied the right to thrive and fully realize their divine purpose. Help us like generations before us who resisted the evil of racism and slavery and human bondage. Help us to use our freedom to continue to bring justice among people and nations everywhere. And in this country where white supremacy still sticks out its ugly head, as today we remember how many people were killed in Oklahoma. 
We come to you today, Lord, with the people whose names we know they are on our list. We also bring to you those names that we hold dear to our own hearts. Whether the challenge is physical or in mind or in, or in soul, we pray for your healing and your presence and your compassion. And be with families that grieve the loss of loved ones. In your presence, enfold them, God, who wept with his own friends. And bring them peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward? God is always with us, not just when everything seems clear and times are good, but also when we struggle with questions and doubt. When we cry out to God, our prayers are heard. When the world cries out to God, we are the part of God's answer, offering water in the desert, offering nourishment to a world that is spiritually hungry. Our gifts this morning are our answer to God's own goodness. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
Lord, we know that there is much work to be done, far more than we ever imagined. We ask that you bless these gifts, that they may be used for the work you have set before us. For we place our lives and trust in you. Amen. I see you. When you go out today, when you hear the cries in the world of all the broken people, dare to step in and say, So bona. And as you do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you all his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen.